say that at the name of Jesus, and at the name of Jesus, come on, praise Him. Why do you clap your hands? I said, because the Bible says, clap your hands, all you people, and shout unto God with a voice of triumph. Consequently, that's why we shout. Why do you raise your hands? Because the Bible says, raise holy hands to a holy God. Why? Why? Someone said to me not long ago, but you, you don't understand, this is what I like to do in worship. I said, it really doesn't matter what you like. What does God like? What does the Bible say? That went over like a lead balloon with some of you, but that's okay. What does the Bible say? No other name. No other name given whereby we must be saved than at the name of Jesus. Have you been saved? Then praise Him. Have you been healed? Then praise Him. Have you been touched? Then praise Him. Have you been blessed? Then praise Him. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Lord, we praise you and we magnify you. We glorify you. We lift you up. We're like David who said, I will call on the name of the Lord who is worthy to be praised. So shall I be saved from my enemies. Even though the sorrows of death compass me and floods of ungodly men made me afraid. But in my distress I cried unto God and he moved heaven and earth to make a way and God, I know that you're the same God that moved for David thousands of years ago. And you're going to move for us today. And we praise you and thank you in advance for what you're going to do in the hearts and lives of every person here. I pray that the Holy Spirit would irrigate down these aisles and in and out of these seats. Would you encourage every discouraged person, strengthen everyone that's weak, feed everyone that's hungry. Save everyone that's lost. Sanctify everyone that believes. Fill everyone that's empty. Lift us above the shadows. Plant our feet on a higher plane today. May we look on the horizon and see the hope, the hope of glory. Our, our Savior and our Lord who's coming back soon. We love you and we praise you. In Jesus' name, God's people said amen. God's people said, praise the Lord. I want you to look right at your neighbor and say, I love you. Just look him right now and say, welcome to Life Change Church. Amen. You may be seated. Look, just look at him again and say, welcome to Life Change Church. And tell him, God wants to change your life. Amen. How many believe God can change somebody's life? I believe that. I said, I believe that. I believe God can change our life. I know it. How do you know? Because he changed my life. And I look around this crowd this morning and I some, know some of you. And I see where he brought you from to where you are today. And I know he changed your life as well. Amen. I know that he's able. He's able. 
able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that worketh in us. And uh, we, we appreciate that today. We're so thankful for God and his grace, his power and his might. We're so, we're so thankful. I want you to bow our heads just a moment, please. Father, I thank you and praise you for every person that's here. I thank you and praise you for your grace that's going to be real to somebody today. And I ask, Lord, that, that every heart and every mind would be open and willing to, to, to allow your Holy Spirit to work in them. We, we give ourselves to you today. We open our heart. We open our mind. We open our spirit up to you. And we say to you, Lord, do whatever you want in us. Further, Lord, take anything out you want to take out. And make us the people that you want us to be. Make us the people you intend us to be. In Jesus' name, amen. There's always, it's always fun whenever you can, you can dedicate babies. And I know that there's a, a, some parents that's going to bring their children. I know at least one, I think, today. If you're here, I want you to come right now and bring your child. And we're going to, we're going to, dedicate. yeah, go ahead and bring your baby here. And we're going to dedicate this, this child to the Lord. Isn't this a beautiful little girl? Amen. It's going to be hard to do this. You're going to distract me here. It was Hannah that prayed to the Lord and asked God for a child. And in 1 Samuel chapter 1, verse 27 and 28, she said, Since the Lord give me this child, I'm going to give him back to the Lord. In Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4, Moses said, Listen, Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and you will love God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your might. He said, The words I command you today, they'll be in your heart. And you'll teach them diligently unto your children. And you'll talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise up. The significance today of this child being dedicated um, is also found in the dedication of the parents. You're dedicating yourself today to raise her to know Jesus. To raise her to know the character and sovereignty of God. She'll know the She'll know the strength of God, the protection of God. She'll know the law of God because she's got a father. And she'll know the compassion and mercy and love of God because she has a mother. And, of course, both of you will express love and both of, will, both of you will express law. <laughs> but nonetheless, there's something about God bringing a man and a woman together to raise a child in the fear and admonition of the Lord. And uh, if that's your intent today, I want you to answer these questions with honesty of heart. Do you recognize this little girl as a gift from God, and do you give thanks to God for his gift? If so, answer, we do. Do you promise to raise your little girl in the fear and admonition of the Lord? If so, answer, we do. Do you promise to give her every possibly bene possible benefit of the home, school, and church? If so, answer, we do. Do you promise as parents to model the life of Christ before her? If so, answer, we do. And do you this day dedicate her to God in front of this assembly? If so, answer, we do. Amen. Could you bring that to me, please? I'm going to have you hold that. Little Brooklyn. That and we'll have you hold this certificate. Congregation, let's pray over Brooklyn today. Father, I thank you and I praise you for this beautiful little baby girl. She is a gift from heaven. She's from you. And we recognize your gift. And I pray that your blessing would be upon her. I ask, Lord, that you would protect her with your angels. May she grow to serve and love you all the days of her life. 
And so today, we dedicate her in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Congregation, I want you to stand. Yeah, that's all right. Go ahead. I want you to stand. Do you, the members of this church, promise to stand with this family, giving, giving them your prayers and support, and also practical and spiritual guidance as needed? If so, answer, by the grace of God, we will. By the grace of God, we will. Amen. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you. Let them know how much we love them. God bless you. See you, beautiful. Amen. You may be seated. Amen. Well, we've been so excited about this I Matter series, uh, and one of the reasons why I was so excited about the I Matter series is because I matter. And uh, see, you don't really think that, but that's okay. I don't need you to think that. But let me try that again. One of the reasons why I'm so excited about the I Matter series is because I matter. Thank you. I really felt so much better. I want to tell you another reason why I'm so excited about the I Matter series is because you matter. Amen. And you say amen. amen. And uh, we were talking about this, Mandy and I was talking about this series this month. Uh, it's been a few weeks ago. And uh, I was talking about the different sermons and ideas and what God was putting on my heart. And of course, Mandy was talking to me about some of the things that, uh, that God was speaking to her. And, you, know, uh, you know, honestly, I get most of my good sermons from Mandy. And uh, it's not true, Mandy. And you notice nobody really responded to that whatsoever. Not that they're really responding to anything right now, but nonetheless. But uh, no, I don't get my good sermons from Mandy. I, 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 I get your my great ones. <laughs> my great ones. Would you welcome on our, our online congregation? Let them know we're glad they're with us today. Sometimes I feel like Adam. Lord, it's this wife you gave me. <laughs> um, nonetheless, she was talking about some stuff. I said, man, that's good. Ooh, I like that. And I said, why don't you take a Sunday morning and preach some of this? So this morning, I'm going to get a break. I, I was in the shower earlier. I said to Mandy, I said, man, I'm so, this feels wonderful. She said, what? I said, I don't have to preach this morning. <laughs> and she's going to preach in a little while. I don't want you to give her your undivided attention, get with her and help her preach it. It's a great message. And honestly, I gave this one to her. <laughs> no. Ushers, I want you to get in place and let's receive the morning tithe and offering. Father, I thank you and praise you for this offering. I ask that as we give it, you'll receive it. And would you receive it, God, and multiply it back into our lives and back into your kingdom, 30, 60, 100-fold, that people may hear of the love of Christ and their life be forever changed. In Jesus' name, amen. Hello, Life Change Church. We have some exciting things going on, so I want you to pay close attention to all the activities that are happening here in October at Life Change Church. First of all, next Sunday evening at 4.30, we have our last connection meeting of this year. Because of the holiday season, we're not gonna have one in November and December, so the last connection meeting of 2012 will be next Sunday evening at 4.30, so make sure that you come. Good morning, Life Change Church. Back here with Bill Kennedy. He's doing some work back here, getting some things ready here in the Welcome Center. And we are slashing prices this morning because, as you know, we are no longer Kingsway Fellowship. We are now Life Change Church. So everything Kingsway has to go. So we have slashed prices on our uh, coffee mugs. We've slashed prices on our Kingsway shirts. So never to be made again. So if you want some Kingsway nostalgic wear or coffee mugs, you need to stop by the Welcome Center on your way out today and pick it up. We just have a few items that are left with the Kingsway logo on it. But we are excited to introduce the new Life Change Church gear. We have a new t-shirt out. There's three different colors of that shirt. There's a blue, a purple, and a light green that say the Catch Connect 
create on there. So you'll want to stop by the Welcome Center today on your way out and pick up some shirts or coffee gear or whatever. And then there's CDs. You can get service CDs and DVDs. There's ladies. There's some uh, items left from our women's conference that are left out here as well. So stop by the Welcome Center on your way out this morning. Attention youth! We are having an event coming up this Friday night at Scallywag Tag. It's gonna go from midnight to 7 a.m. in the morning. So it's gonna be an all-nighter. We're gonna have food, we're gonna have games, some Xboxes going on. There's also gonna be an awesome rocking concert happening at about 3 a.m. in the morning. Bring all the friends you can. We wanna get as many people as possible. If you are looking for any details, we're gonna have a sign-up sheet right outside in the foyer after service today. So this Friday night, don't forget, be there. It's gonna be an awesome time. Attention you! Good morning, Life Change Church. Got a couple secrets to tell you, so you gotta keep it on the down low, all right? First one is, I'm sitting on Pastor's car. He doesn't know it. He, yeah, he, he wouldn't like that. Secondly, coming up on the 28th, the 28th of this month is Pastor Appreciation Day. Mark your calendars. We're asking all of you to bring a card. Write something in there about how you appreciate him. And if you want to put a gift in that card, that is totally up to you. But at least bring a card. We'll have baskets out in the foyer. You can put your cards in on your way in. So don't forget, Pastor Appreciation Day coming up on October 28th. Don't forget, October 28th at 6 p.m. is our family fall fun night. We're having the chili cook-off, and we're going to be eating good. We're going to worship outside, and then we're going to have our trunk or treat for our kids. So don't forget your candy. Don't forget your chili. Bundle up so that we can stay warm, and we're going to have a great night of fun. So be here October 28th at 6 o'clock for our family fall fun night. I'll find myself wanting to please the crowd. I'll find myself wanting to please the crowd. I'll need you to remind me that I should obey God. That I should obey God. I'll act like I don't have any problems. I'll need you to show me how to share my struggles with others. I'll want to have a lot of money so I can buy what I want. I'll need you to teach me that my things belong to God. That my things belong to God. I'll struggle with my looks and appearance. I'll need you to remind me that God wonderfully made me. I'll tend to think about myself before others. I'll need you to teach me that the last will become first. The last will become first. The last will become first. I'll think I'm a lot smarter than I actually am. I'll think I'm a lot smarter than I actually am. I'll need you to show me how to learn from God's wisdom. I'll want to avoid hard conversations. I'll want to avoid hard conversations. I'll need you to show me how to speak the truth. In love. In love. I'll look for happiness in many different places. I'll need you to show me that joy is found in following Christ. I'll find myself stuck in bad habits. I'll need you to show me the way out. I'll need you to show me the way out. I'll need you. I'll need you. I'll need you. I'll need you. To point me toward Christ when no one else will. To point me toward Christ when no one else will. Here at Life Change Church, we have a little over an hour to impact a child in a way that could change their whole life. If you'd like to be part of this process and, and planting seeds in our children's ministry, then please come back to Connection Corner after service this morning. We'd love for you to volunteer. Thank you. I've pulled off beautiful and cute, as well as ugly and appalling. I've come across as both loud and quiet. I've seen all of these. I'm tired of seeming. I want to be one thing and not another, but being becomes seeming according to whose love I'm pursuing in the moment. Pursuit, <laughs> a word that's perpetually a mystery to me. It seems that if you chase after a ball, you catch it, or if you hunt for your lost keys, you find them. Yet all the things that I've pursued must have been figments of my imagination because I never could get my hands around them at times it was as if I just needed to reach out and grab it. But some things in life will always be just out of reach. Always so close, but never close enough. I can remember trying so hard to please my parents as a child. It was my central pursuit. I just wanted their acceptance, but nothing I did was ever good enough. This one time, I had worked so hard on my spelling words and had finally gotten a 90%. I kept my test in my hand the whole bus ride home. 
I couldn't stop returning the smile of the bright red smiley face my teacher had drawn on my test. As soon as I got off the bus, I sprinted down our long driveway. My belly is tickling with excitement. I knew this was just what I needed to get their approval. My mom, she at least looked at me for a few seconds. My dad, I'm not sure he even knows my name. Am I like a rushed through portrait whose artist shoved her in an overly crowded drawer? Did even my mother bear no joy of giving life? I saw her rare blue eyes but a few times. She kept them shut from seeing me. If her kiss would have ever touched my lips, it might have steadied my uneasy breath when I got scared. Restless and wanting, I searched the harder. I knew not what except that something was missing. Something similar to the bright red smiley face my teacher took the time to draw for me. I slowly began to accept that alienation was always going to be the way it was for me. Oh, but I fought against it. At home, I made it seem as if I had all the friends in the world. At school, I made it seem as if I didn't need any more friends. I stopped making up names for friends in high school. High school. The fountainhead of social engagement, or so I hear. That wasn't the case for me. I became perpetually less known. With each mundane inhale, the air grew more indifferent those four years. My life, a quiet life, was not life at all. I learned two, two things those four years. First, I noticed that peace came in sleep, where I dreamt of being something I'm not to anybody. Second, I learned a life lesson that no teacher ever taught me, that being alone had nothing to do with proximity. I realized this after two years of being bumped and slammed in two in the hallways, after eating lunch every day, elbow to elbow with the same people, but never having the opportunity to clear my throat to say, I'm not new. I've gone to the school since second grade. We're in the same homeroom class together. I just heard talks about the new girl, and as I looked around, I saw nobody new. I was the new girl at least six times those four years. Break, break, break. I wish I were worthy enough to be broken because that would mean that someone noticed me with enough interest to pick me up, drop me as they may. I'd gladly accept the fall because it would mean that there was at least somebody who looked into my eyes. was nothing but hope and illusion I soon had to learn. Graduating high school was supposed to be my chance to finally be me. I was ready to reinvent myself again. I grew tired of being timid and uncertain of everyone around me. I mastered the art of hair and makeup shortly after high school and learned what was flattering and what wasn't. I was flattered all right. I met my future husband four times and slept with all of them. Where's Jeff? Oh, Jeff. Love was always something I had longed for. It was one of my pursuits in childhood. I'll never understand how every man who brands love in our lives somehow gains a power for it, to which we become victim to with each backward glance. Jeff, just saying his name makes every nerve experience the oddest mixed sensation throughout my whole body. If he had loved me with that face of his, I might have been a normal woman now. But he did not love me, nor I him, that's for sure. Maybe I'm not worthy. Nobody told me that love was like a thorn. It sticks you and you bleed. But Jeff, he made me long for thorns because I still haven't stopped bleeding since he thrust a knife into my back. The tip came out of my chest. And here I am, well into my adult years, or at least. Seems. 
my pursuit, my seeming pursuits, they've left me love lorn with heavy pink eyes. I've learned one more thing, that love essentially means pain, and pain is something awful, which I dare not touch or else I'll die of love. Close over me, God. Peer into these unsteady eyes that fill with tears. Do even you hear me? Let me go. <laughs> Take back your gift, this seeming life. I don't want it. Jesus loved me, this I should know, but love I know not. <laughs> if life and love develop from within, between the seen and unseen, bursting through the scriptures, what is it with me? Why is such a rejected, insignificant, vulnerably loveless life? From a loving God. Maybe you felt like this. I think that probably all of us, in some way, shape, or form, have probably felt how this girl felt. Maybe by parents, maybe by peers, maybe by relationships, but all of us have been left feeling like a blip on the screen of life, that we don't matter, that we're insignificant, that our life really doesn't mean a whole lot. But I just want you to know today, you matter. You matter. I want to title my sermon today, I Matter, Seeming is Not Believing. Seeming is not believing. I want to read a scripture. It's in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 and 4. It says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ, according as he has chosen us. I want to read that again because I think we all need to get a hold of the fact that he has chosen us in him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. Let's pray. Father, I pray that you will touch each and every person in this place, each and every heart. Lord, I pray that we'll leave today knowing that we really do matter to you, that we really have a purpose and a plan. I pray that every person here will get a hold of that, not just in their head, but in their heart, in Jesus' name, amen. I read a quote that said this. It said, sometimes I feel like the whole world is a cigarette and I'm the only ashtray. You ever felt like that? You ever felt like that it just seems like all of the ashes of life are getting dumped on you? You're surrounded by junk and you are the trash can. Listen, I read a statistic that there are over 40 million adults right now that are suffering, suffering with an anxiety or depression disorder. That is the highest mental health problem in the United States, anxiety and depression. One in every eight children 18 and younger are suffering with an anxiety disorder because people have nothing but fear and worry and dread. They, they don't know financially what's going to happen because the economy is in bad shape. We don't have the security of that. 
They've been rejected by parents. They've been rejected by peers. They've been rejected. They don't, they've never felt that unconditional love. And so instead of having security and, and, and feeling a self-worth and being proud of, of who God's made them to be, they're, they're worrying, they're in fear, they're in doubt, they're depressed. Billions of dollars the United States spends every year trying to help people somehow muddle through this thing we call life. Somehow wading through this cloud of depression and darkness and anxiety and, and maybe medicating them enough that they can somehow function. Because they live with this fear and anxiety that there will never be anything good happen in their life. That they have no purpose. That their life has no meaning. And so they're muddling through life. But let me tell you something today. God can change that in your life. Amen. There's a Bible character that you all know that probably felt that way at some point. His name's David. How many remember David in the Bible? Well, if you remember, David was just a boy at the time that Saul was chosen by the people to be king. And Saul was like the model king. I mean, he was tough. He was strong. He was big. He was tall. He was, and I mean, he was the model king. But his heart, it wasn't kingly. And God rejected him. And, and the Bible says in, in 1 Samuel chapter 16 that Samuel was just whining around about it still. He was still crying and mourning. And God finally said, Samuel, the, to the prophet Samuel, he said, get over it. I've rejected Saul live with it. You get up and what you're going to do is you're going to anoint me a new king. I'll tell you what you do. You get a horn and you fill it with oil. Oil is representative of the Holy Spirit, yeah. the anointing of God. He said, I want you to fill this horn with oil and I want you to go to Bethlehem. There's a man there by the name of Jesse and one of his sons is going to be king. And Samuel said, you don't seem to understand. Saul is not too happy about being rejected by you. <laughs> he's a little moody right now. And um, if he finds out, he's going to have my head. He's going to slit my throat. And God said, I tell you what, get a heifer. Say, I'm going to go sacrifice. Bring Jesse along with you. Get in a room by yourself and have him bring his sons before you. When you get there, I'll tell you what to do from there. So Samuel went on his way, and he got Jesse, and he said, I want you to bring your sons before me. And let me tell you something. Talk about a proud daddy. I mean, one of my boys. That's right. He's going to be king. One of my boys. And so he lines them up. I mean, he lines them up. And I mean, you got to imagine Jesse's chest sticking out at this point. Like, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. That's right. Uh-huh. Here's my boys. And so the first one's up there, Eliab. And I mean, he looks like a king. He's tall, he's strong, he's dark. He can look sinister if he needs to. He can look kingly if he needs to. I mean, he's got the look, you know? And Jesse's standing there like, I know this is it. Even Samuel got confused because Samuel looked and said, surely this is the one. I mean, look at him. He just looks like a king. Put a crown on his head. He's in. This has got to be the guy. And God said, no, that's not my man. And he told Samuel, he said, you're looking in the wrong way because you're looking on the outward appearance. But what I look at is the heart. And so he brought, he said, no, that's not it. Just, okay, I know my next one will be. I know. He sets him up there. God said, no. The third one. This has got to be it. The third one. No. Seven sons later, everyone, nope, nope, nope. God said no. Man, I, I, Samuel's got to be discouraged at the end of this because clearly God told him one of Jesse's sons is going to be king. I mean, it, it, I've gone through the list. So he looks at Jesse in desperation and says, do you have any more? I, I know God told me this. 
But he keeps saying, no, do you have any more sons? And Jesse's like, I mean, there's David. I mean, but he's just out keeping the sheep. I mean, this is David. This is the runt of the litter. I mean, this is little red-faced, handsome, flowy hair David that, you know, he just, he just looks pretty, and he looks pretty out there standing with his sheep. I mean, we don't think a whole lot of him, but, I mean, there is David. And Samuel said, I'll tell you what, we're not leaving this place till he comes. Somebody go get him. And when he came in that room, the Holy Spirit yeah. spoke said, that's my boy right there. <laughs> that's my boy. Listen, he seemed insignificant. He seemed like he's the least likely candidate for king that could ever be. He seemed like he was a reject of the family. I mean, his own father didn't even think to bring him in when Samuel told him to go get his kids. His own father rejected that he could have any potential whatsoever to be king. But God said, that's my boy. That's, my, that's the one right there. Let me tell you something. You might have been rejected by people. I mean, people might have said that you would never be worthy, that you could never do anything for God. You might have been rejected by your own parents. But I want to tell you today that you are accepted by God. You are accepted by the Father. And it doesn't matter who you are or what you've done. Because the Bible says that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. What does that mean? That means that God accepted you when he saw you in your dirt, your filth, your sin, your muck, your mire, your grossness. You, God accepted you when you were nothing but a lowly sinner. What an awesome thought. The Bible says we are adopted by God. Well, I was having a conversation the other night with some ladies at dinner about adoption. And there's a book... Um, called I Chose You. And you know, the beaut I think one of the most beautiful things about adoption is this. When, when you have your own child, you get whatever God gives you. You know what I mean? I mean, and I gotta tell you, God gave me some pretty amazing children. Did you see my daughter up here? And if anybody has Facebook, did you see their pictures? We got professional pictures taken yesterday. And my kids are gorgeous. I'm not bragging, but. I am bragging because they are, they look just like their mother. It's amazing. <laughs> you gave me the mic. <laughs> I can tell you the uh, <laughs> but I think that the most amazing thing about adoption is that child is chosen by the parents. And look, that's what I love that God chose to say that he adopted us. Because what's that saying? That's saying we didn't just by happen chance become his children. He looked down upon everybody that he ever made and said, I choose you. I choose to adopt you into my family. I choose to use you. I choose to call you. He chose you. He accepted you. And here's what I find absolutely amazing about this story. Even after Jesse and his brothers saw David be accepted as the king, as the gift from God, anointed, saw the oil dripping off his head. I mean, they stood there. It says he stood in the midst of his brethren and was anointed. Yet, you go a little further down and you see this Goliath. I mean, this giant who is just absolutely terrorizing the children of Israel, killing people left and right, saying, bring it on. Bring it on. And you see that David's brothers, Jesse said, oh, I'll tell you who can get him. It's those boys of mine. The same boys that he lined up first, you know, the seven that God said no to. Jesse still said, mm, these are my pick. Yeah. Yeah. This is my pick. And Jesse had them down trying to fight. And you know what he sent David to do? Bring them cheese. Yeah. It's in your Bible. Read it. He was the cheese bearer <laughs> to these boys. I mean, he watched his son be picked of God out of all of 
his boys, yet that dad still couldn't accept that he was a king. His dad still couldn't accept that this is who he was, and he just said, oh, he's a good little boy. He's pretty. Let's give him some cheese and let him take it to his brothers. You see, because in his eyes, he still wasn't significant. He still wasn't worthy. He still wasn't what a king should be. You know, the Bible says when he went down and David said, I'll take him. Because David, David, God had already told David who he was. David had no problem with it. I mean, everybody else might have said one thing, but David went down there to take the cheese and said, you know what? I might have brought you all cheese, but you're standing here shivering in your tent while this guy's mocking the name of God. But God's already told me who I am, and so I'm going to take him on. And so they, they said that they tried to put Saul's armor on him. And I just get this picture that it's like Alex trying to walk around in Troy's clothes. I mean, it just starts hanging off of him. You know, because he wasn't even close to what the people thought a king should be. You see, the people chose Saul. But God chose David. And the people saw in Saul this big, mighty man. And they, but see, God saw his heart. He saw what he could be, saw his potential. And he went down there and God anointed that boy with a few stones and a sling to take down that giant. You are significant. Now, let me tell you what we try to do. You see, we forget that we are God's workmanship. In Ephesians 2.10, it talks about that we're created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared before him, beforehand that we should walk in them. But here's what we do. We search for acceptance in what other people think of us. So according to whoever we're around at the time, we act accordingly so that we may be accepted. So when I'm around church people, woo, I mean, I'm holy. I'm praising Jesus. I'm Speaking the lingo, come on, you don't have to be in church more than two weeks before you start knowing what this church lingo is. But man, when I'm around my friends that like to drink, well, let's party it up! You know? So we try to find our acceptance in who we think we should be around other people. We try to find our significance in what we do. Uh, If I could just get an A on this test, if I could just get this touchdown, if I could just play this sport, maybe my mom and dad will think I'm good enough. If I just can get this job, if I can just make this much money, then maybe I'll be worthy. And so we begin to look for our significance in what we do. And we begin to look for love and unconditional love and security in relationships, just like that girl. You know, she thought if I could just find somebody who'll show me love, then maybe I'll be worthy. Maybe I'll be secure. Maybe I won't be living in such fear and doubt and dread if I just had somebody to love me. And we look at all those things, and you can see in the life of David, any time he ever got distracted from who God says he was on that that little apartment or whatever, that room, when he got distracted from that and felt like he needed to find his self-worth in something else, he fell every single time. You remember whenever he, he lost his worthiness in, in who God told him he was, and so he decided, I'm going to number the people because I need to find my significance in the fact that I have conquered all of these people, and I have a great nation, and I have a great army, and this is who I am, and I am the great King David, and I need to... And he tried to find his self-worth in that. Yeah. Yeah. Come on. That's right. That's and God judged him. Because God's like, I already told you who you were. You don't have to do that. It's not bad to accomplish great things, but when we try to find our worth in that, that's what gets us in trouble. And you remember he wanted that love, that unconditional love. And, you know, he's feeling maybe a little insecure. And so it was really easy for him whenever he was standing on the roof and saw Bathsheba bathing up there to say, okay, that's what I need. That's what's going to fulfill this void that's missing. Come on. When all along God said, I filled it. Yeah. I've already filled it. 
You see, we are looking and looking and searching and trying to find our fulfillment and our worth and our acceptance in all of these people and in all of these things when all along God's standing over here going, I've already told you who you were. I've already told you that you're accepted. I've already told you what your self-worth is. He screamed it from the cross. Jesus was rejected. Jesus was beaten. People vehemently said, kill this man, crucify him. They took him and nailed him after he had been beaten and bludgeoned and bruised and was a mangled mess. They didn't stop there. They nailed him to a cross to suffocate and die as they screamed and cussed and cursed at him. And that would have to feel horrible. But even worse than that, the father turned his back on Jesus and rejected him because of the filth and the sin and the dirt that we committed. Do you know why he did that? He rejected Jesus so that we could be accepted into his family. And it's screaming from the cross. I've already accepted you. This is how worthy you are. I've loved you this much. And yet we are groping and searching. Come on. Trying to find our self-worth somewhere else. When it's the perfect picture. The cross already is screaming it to you today. And here is what I love the most about this story. Because God didn't just stop with making him king and with giving him a great kingdom. And, and, and here's what's awesome. You know, David messed up. I, I'm sure we all know that. I've already said the two, two times he fell. But listen, David was a hot mess just like the rest of us. But let me tell you what I love. I love that when David messed up royally, God never one time changed his mind about who David was. That not one time did God say, I take back my anointing. I, I changed my mind. You're not made for this. This is not your purpose. This is not who you are. You've already messed up. This disqualifies you. God didn't disqualify him, even though all of us would have disqualified David to be king. God did not disqualify him. God said, I don't care because I've already told you who you were. Get back. Find your way back to me, David. Find your self-worth in who I've already said you are. Don't lose sight of who I've said you are. And God wooed him and called him and drew him back. No matter what he did, God never changed his mind about David. And not only did God not change his mind, he established his throne for eternity. Yeah. <laughs> First Kings 2.45 says, The throne of David shall be established before the Lord forever. Isaiah 9, 6, and 7 says, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end. On the throne of David. Yeah. God said, listen, not only am I not going to disqualify you, but Jesus himself is going to sit on the throne that I have established for you. And is going to rule and reign for eternity. Jesse might have rejected him. His brothers might have rejected him. His own son at one time rejected him and tried to kill him. His peers, everybody might have rejected him. But God said, not only do I accept you, but I think you're worthy enough that the throne I establish is going to have Jesus himself sit on it. That is an awesome thought. And boy, I tell you what, I can't wait to get to heaven one day. And see, as Jesus is sitting on the throne of David, ruling and reigning, and David walks up to that throne and bows before it and says, I thank you, God, that you never gave up on me. I thank you, God, that you always saw the potential in who I could possibly be, that you always saw something in me that nobody else ever saw. And I want to tell you today, Everybody might have said that you are one thing, but it doesn't matter what anybody says. 
All that matters is what does God say about you? What has God said about you? Let me tell you what he said. He said, you matter. Before you were even born, as he was forming you and making you in your mother's womb, he said, this one matters. This one has a plan. This one has a purpose. This one is going to touch people. You matter. I want you to stand with me. I want you to be reverent, bow your heads, close your eyes. And all I ask from you today is for complete honesty. Because I believe that there are so many in here that maybe you felt like David did, that you've been rejected by people, by yourself even. And I just want you to be honest enough to say, you know what, that's me. You might be saved, you might not be saved. Who would say today, you know, I felt like this before. I felt like I wasn't worthy, I felt rejected. I see those hands. Let me tell you something today. God wants you to know you matter. You matter. And as Edwin begins to play and Troy begins to sing, if this is you, maybe you felt rejected, maybe you felt hurt, maybe you felt insignificant, I just want you to take a brave and bold step and come to this altar today and allow God to tell you who you are. Allow God to heal your mind of everything that everybody else has said and let him tell you who you are. There are some coming. If that's you, I want you to come. today and you've never discovered God's purpose for your life. Maybe you've never accepted Jesus Christ. Maybe at one time you were, you were walking in his will and you knew the love and grace of God and you've drifted away from him. Maybe you're here today and you've just been drifting ever so slightly away from him. As David did a few times. And you say, Pastor, I, I need to come. I need, I, need God to, I need God to speak into my heart and my life. I need to feel the significance of the Father. I need to hear Calvary say to me that I matter. I matter because I want you to know you truly do matter. God loves you. I want to sing it one more time if you need to pray. Why don't you join these and come? I surrender all I time. Everybody sing it with me that knows this. Sing it. I surrender all. I surrender all. All to Thee, my blessed Savior. I surrender. 
Father, I thank you and praise you for the faithfulness of the Holy Spirit. I thank you for every person that prays at the altar right now. And I ask God that you would so, so speak to them and so love them that they would know how much not, that they are accepted, how significant they are. Yeah. Would you peel back the veil and let them see your purposes in their life and your will for their life. And may they find security in Jesus today. I pray that you'll save them and lift them and help them. I ask God that each one of us will hear Calvary scream to us that we're accepted and that we're significant. And I pray, God, that that will, that will build security in our lives. Lord, as we leave this place, cause your face to shine upon each one. Be gracious to each one. And we'll praise you forever. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Don't forget church tonight.